very familiar to us. It's in the New Testament Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It's found in your pew Bibles on page 757. And again, together, let's listen to the Word of God. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of this, his holy word. Well, my friends, the good news is God has a plan. A plan for our salvation, a plan for the remaking, recreating of our fallen and broken world. The even better news is God has always had this plan, and down through the ages, God has always been faithful to this plan. Even way back in the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, kicking off all of the problems that now plague our world still today, God had a plan, and he announced it to his creation that he would send a savior, a descendant of Eve, who would crush the head of evil. God made that promise. God made that covenant with us. And again, down through the centuries, he has been faithful to that promise. And throughout the ages, here and there along the way, God has revealed little new bits of information to us about how exactly he was going to accomplish that plan. In Genesis chapter 11, he chose one man out of all of the people that were living at that time. He chose Abraham to start a new family, a new nation. And through that family, through Abraham and his descendants, God said, the whole world would be blessed. Through Abraham's family and the nation that would come from it, this plan would be fulfilled. And the promise was passed down to Isaac and then to Jacob, who was renamed Israel, and then to Israel's 12 sons, who became the fathers of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And several centuries later, God revealed to Moses, after rescuing Israel from slavery and bringing them to the foot of Mount Sinai, God revealed to Moses that this nation of Israel would be to him 
a kingdom of priests. Now, what does that mean? Kingdom of priests. Well, a priest is a mediator. A priest is a person who brings human beings together with God, makes that connection between God and human beings. So in other words, Israel was being called by God to be a priestly nation between God and all of the other nations of the world, that through their faithful living and through their faithful worship, they would shine the light of God to all the ends of the earth. This is how all of the nations in God's plan were going to be blessed through Abraham and his descendants. But any of you who know your Old Testament know that Israel almost never fulfilled this part of the plan. Israel was rarely faithful, and she almost never made that holy connection between God and the other nations of the world. There are a few notable exceptions like Rahab and Ruth and Naaman and the widow of Zarephath and a few others, but by and large, when Israel bothered to be faithful, she wanted to keep her God all to herself. She wanted to believe that God was sending that Savior only for herself and not for any of the other nations of the world. And in fact, by the time of Jesus, we have a record of certain rabbis teaching that indeed the only reason that God created all of the other nations of the world was because he needed something to fuel the fires of hell good outreach strategy, right? <laughs> and yet God still had a plan. And as we heard in our first scripture reading for today, his people's sinfulness did not get in the way of this plan that God had from the very beginning. Instead, Isaiah says, now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. God says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations or a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. Now, this is one of those passages that we read with our New Testament eyes, and we immediately see God is talking about the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. It is God speaking to his perfect servant, Jesus, telling him what he plan he has had all along that Jesus is going to fulfill for him. And what God is saying is, it's too light a thing, it's too small a thing, it's too insignificant a thing that Jesus would only come to save the Israelites. That's not enough for God. It's not enough for God to send a Savior just for one nation of the world, even if they are his chosen people, his beloved Israel. God instead chooses to do more. God chooses to send his servant, his Messiah, his Savior Jesus, to be a light for the nations, a light for the Gentiles, that his salvation would reach to the ends of the earth. And as I said, that would have shocked a lot of people. It would have offended a lot of people. Might even offend some people today. Even though God had called Israel to be that priestly nation, too many in Israel grew up believing God loves us and hates everyone else. And yet the scriptures show us that God never, never said or believed or thought that at all. That God wants 
at least representatives of all the nations of the world to experience his salvation. That's been his plan from the very beginning. That is his plan still today, that the Savior, the Messiah, would come not just for Israel, but for all the peoples of the world, and that by coming for all the nations, that he would heal the divide, the rift that breaks us up into all the little groups and nations and ethnicities and cabals of the world that one day all together would be one body of faithful believers who would worship God and God alone. And here on this Epiphany Sunday, we see the beginnings of that plan being fulfilled with the coming of the Magi to see baby Jesus. Now, we've talked several times about who these Magi are. You may remember that they are wise men, advisors, uh, cabinet-level ministers, VIPs. As much as I love the first hymn, I'm sorry they weren't kings. I don't know how that got started. We're still going to sing We Three Kings because how can we not? But they weren't kings. They were wise men. They were advisors, probably from modern-day Iran, from Persia, probably cabinet-level advisors to the Shah, the king of Persia, trained in all sorts of learning and knowledge. In other words, these wise men were wealthy, they were cultured, they were powerful, they were highly educated, and they were very, very different from the Jewish peasant family that they traveled hundreds of miles, if not a thousand miles, to come and visit. And yet they fell on their knees before the same baby Jesus that Mary and Joseph and the shepherds had worshipped on that so-called silent night. They worshipped the same Savior that Mary and Joseph and the shepherds worshipped, and they gave their costly treasures to him as gifts. God had placed a desire within them to go and find the newborn king of the Jews, It's fascinating to read the histories of the time because many of the historians record that somewhere and nobody knew where this idea just took hold all around the world that something big was going to happen, that a a savior was going to be born and he was going to be born in the east in Judea and he was going to be the son of God and the savior of the world. Everybody knew that. That was common knowledge. It just You can only see the hand of God in this, that God got everybody ready for this big thing that was coming. What set the wise men apart is they not only believed it, but they acted upon it. They believed that idea and they started looking for the signs that God was going to indeed fulfill that promise, that plan. And somehow, and we don't know exactly how, But as they were looking up in the skies, they saw something in the stars that convinced them that the big event had finally happened. And again, most importantly, they acted on that. And they went and they found the newborn king. And when they found him, they weren't repulsed by his poverty. They weren't turned off by the fact that he was the tiny, helpless infant. They were not too big or too rich or too powerful or too important to humble themselves and worship this Jewish peasant child and present to him their incredibly expensive gifts. They were simply glad, they were blessed, they were honored to meet Jesus. And we still remember them for that today. We remember the epiphany that they had. As it says at the top of your bulletins, today is Epiphany Sunday, the Sunday closest to the Feast of Epiphany, which is always January the 6th, the 12th day of the season of 
Christmas. Yes, the 12 days of Christmas come after, not before, okay? Tomorrow's the last day. But an epiphany, if you're not familiar with the word, is an aha moment. A moment when you get it, when you finally grasp, when you understand something that was hidden before, when you finally have the wisdom and the insight to to see and understand something that you couldn't see or understand before. It's a word that's also sometimes used for when God reveals himself to a human being. God, who could not be seen before, is now seen. On this day, the wise men, the magi, had the epiphany of their lives. They finally, after seeking and seeking and seeking, aha, found Jesus, God who had been hidden from them before. And for the first time, we now have a peek into the nature of this new thing that God was doing through Jesus, this new covenant that he was establishing in which his son came as savior, not just for Israel, but for all the nations of the world. Because look at who is there at that house in Bethlehem. You've got Jews and you've got Gentiles. You've got the rich and the poor. You've got men and women. You've got the educated and the uneducated. You've got VIPs and you've got people who very soon are going to be so powerless, they're going to be refugees on the run for their lives. And the one person who unites all of those people is a baby who just happens to be the savior of the world. The one person who unites all of those different kinds of people is Jesus. And again, this has been God's plan from the beginning. To break down all of those dividing walls of hostility, to create one body, one church for all believers, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, men or women, rich or poor, young or old. And the thing is, this calling, this plan, continues on today, here among us. We continue to be called by God to be his kingdom of priests. God says through Peter in his first letter, you, he's speaking to the church, you, we are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a people who belong to God so that we may proclaim God's excellences God who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's a reason when John has that incredible end times vision and revelation of what it's going to be like in heaven, says that he sees people from representatives of every nation, tribe, and tongue, because that has been God's plan all along. That all kinds of people would be united together in Christ as a body of believers, which means if we're going to be faithful, we can't keep hiding behind these walls, keeping Jesus all to ourselves. We need to spread this good news. We need to spread this gospel, and not just to the so-called quote-unquote good people of the world, not just to people who look like us or talk like us or live like us or act like us, but to everyone. The gospel is for all kinds of people. I have a friend who was a Presbyterian pastor up near the Dayton area, north of Dayton, who after two long years, he and his wife finally were able to adopt two children from the nation of Haiti. And any of you who have been involved in any kind of adoption process or you know somebody that's been involved in adoption, particularly an international adoption, you know that is a hard process. That is an inefficient process. 
It takes all kinds of time. It takes all kinds of visiting. My friend had to go down to Haiti over and over again to deal not only with the U.S. government bureaucracy, but the Haitian government bureaucracy. You talk about inefficient. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of prayer. But finally, after all of those years, my friend was able to adopt a brother and sister who became his son and daughter. But again, if you know anything about Haiti, you know that 95 plus percent of Haitians are black. And after adopting his new son and daughter, my friend the pastor was informed by a family in the church that they were withdrawing their membership because they didn't want to go to a church where the pastor would actually dare to have black children. I'm not making this up. This is a Presbyterian church, and this happened in the 21st century. Eventually, my friend moved on to another church, and just by some strange coincidence, another friend of mine became pastor of that same church. And because the old guy with the offensive colored children had left, this family was now talking about coming back to the church. And the elders got really excited, and they told the new pastor, hey, this family wants to come back. By the way, this is why they left. And my friend said to them, well, of course, they are welcome to come back, but they can only become members, of course, if they repent, right? If they apologize for the sins that they committed, right? And she stared them down, and they finally agreed. Because there's a principle at stake here, isn't there? The gospel is not just for white people. And the gospel is not just for Americans. And the gospel is not just for, ooh, yes, Lord, we're paying attention. We're listening. The gospel is not just for Democrats, and the gospel is not just for Republicans, and the gospel is not just for people who worship with an organ and a piano. It's also for people who worship with a guitar and drums, or a balalaika, or a sitar, or tribal drums and flute. The gospel is for people of every nation, tribe, and tongue, and we need to be willing to welcome all kinds of people into our churches and moreover, to be willing to start thinking of all kinds of people as our brothers and sisters in Christ and to treat them accordingly. Which means to be willing to care for them and pray for them and provide for their needs and to let them care for us and pray for us and provide for our needs because that's what family does, right? We take care of each other. We don't have second-class citizens in a family, or at least we shouldn't. We don't cut people out of the family that we don't like or say, I'm not going to have anything to do with that person in the family anymore, not if we're going to be a true family in Christ. We don't say, I only deal with the parts of the family that look like me. I'm going to deal with the outlaws too. The whole family belongs to me, and I belong to the whole family. That's why our missions committee is support, so supportive of our missionaries to Asia, Ryan and Maggie. That's why they're on our prayer list every single week. That's why our missions committee is looking to expand our overseas mission commitments. Because yes, it's important to reach out to our individual community here, and we do that a lot. And we reach out to all different kinds of people in the greater Cincinnati area. But we're also called to be light for the world the whole world, that through our work and through our prayers and through our financial commitments and through any other way that we can come up with, we invite people from all kinds of homelands and cultures and situations to join us in the one church of Jesus Christ. That's part of what it means to follow Jesus, that when we love him, we love the people he loves. 
we love all the people that he came to die for. Do you love in this way? Do your prayers include a time when you lift up people, not just from your own family or your own job or your own church, although, of course, we need to do that. But do we also pray for people from all around the world? Are we being priests for Jesus? Seeking to help make those connections between other people and God. Seeking by our prayers and our financial support and our witness and our outreach and our actions to bring others before the Lord in whatever way we can. For there are so many who still, like the Magi were, were seeking Jesus. Seeking to have that epiphany, that aha moment. In this new year in 2020, let us be the ones to help as many of those people as we can and to welcome as many of them as they can into our church, even if they are not like us. Let's get involved in God's plan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God alone be the glory. Let us pray. God, we are so grateful that you welcome all different kinds of people, and we are especially grateful that you have welcomed us into your church. Help us, Lord, to reach out in the same love that you have reached out to us, that we may lead many to find you. And Lord, as we come to your table, nourish us to be your servants in Jesus' name. Amen.